Justice DAO. Um, I lead our work on access to medicines, which we've been doing for several years now. And um, yeah, I've been around in the organization for a long time. This is my 13th year in Global Justice Now. And I know that for many of the years I've been at Global Justice Now, I've always known of URC's um, partnership with us as Global Justice Now. And we really appreciate your support um, and your ongoing um, commitment <laughs> to us as an organization and the work that we do. We're really grateful for it and appreciate it. Um, just to let you know as well that um, I myself, I'm, I am a Christian. Um, I don't, though I don't worship in a URC church, I worship in a local independent church. Um, so yeah, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be sharing about our um, uh, vaccines campaign. Uh, we showed a few of those clips in that silent prayer segment just now, uh, but hopefully I can sort of fill out um, a bit more information about the issue um, and share with you some of the things that we've been doing around it as well. So, um, you know, since the pandemic broke out, um, governments around the world um, were all kind of pinning their hopes on the development of a safe and effective vaccine. Um, it was always going to be kind of one of the very only sustainable routes out of the pandemic and out of this constant cycle of lockdown and social restrictions, which has caused, you know, unprecedented damage to our economies and also to our societies um, and all sorts of other issues um, that we have come across in the past year, both in this country and around the world. And in the UK, we have you know, been really excited about seeing this roadmap that the government's introduced and this roadmap will lead to more and more unlocking over the coming months um, alongside the NHS uh, rollout of the vaccine. And so there is a sense of you know, light at the end of the tunnel for us here in the UK, um, but sadly, this is not the sort of story, the same story across the world. Um, and in fact, it's um, a story for only the richest countries in the world. Um, at the moment, over 75% of all global vaccinations that have taken place have been administered in just 10 countries. Meanwhile, not a single dose has been administered in 130 countries around the world. Um, and low and middle income countries are, are looking like they're going to have to wait until 2023 or 2024 for widespread vaccination. So how did we get to this situation? How did we end up in a situation of such grotesque inequality around access to vaccines? Well, first of all, last year, we saw a lot of hoarding by rich countries. Uh, countries like the UK, the US and the EU raced ahead to start buying up doses even as early as last summer, even before the vaccines were proven to be effective and, and safe. They bought them up in advance. Um, uh, and to the extent where now um, rich countries have enough doses to vaccinate their populations almost three times over. Meanwhile, um, people living in the poorest countries in the world are, are, are looking, are projected to see only one in, ten, one, in, one in 10 people will have access to a vaccine this year. Um, and this has not gone unnoticed. Um, even the chief of the WHO, the World Health Organization, has commented that this situation is a catastrophic moral failure. Um, and the price of this failure will be paid for by the li lives and the livelihoods of people in the poorest countries. Um, and so when we see this level of inequality, it, it's shocking um, on a very fundamental moral basis, because if we don't vaccinate the world, then actually we're going to see even more deaths. And a recent study showed that we could prevent 61% of deaths globally if we distributed vaccines fairly rather than hoarding um, them by rich countries. But there's also a strong um, uh, argument around public health and the economy for distributing vaccines uh, more equitably across the world. From a public, some people would say in the UK, it's good that we're getting vaccinated first, we should sort ourselves first, out first and then we can sort out the rest of the world later. Um, that's an argument that I've heard quite a few times um, and certainly I was on Radio 5 a few weeks ago and a lot of callers were calling in saying, why can't we sort ourselves out first? Why do we have to um, why would we sacrifice a, a dose here for maybe an elderly person for a healthcare worker in Malawi, for example? But actually, um, what we argue is that actually it's 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 to, to, to think about just uh, vaccinating our own country first and then locking the and then and then and then feeling sitting tight on our own sort of health security is actually quite self-defeating because the longer you leave the virus out there spreading and transmitting um, to unvaccinated populations, you're allowing that 
virus to essentially mutate and to develop other variants and potentially a variant that could be um, uh, immune to our current vaccines and render the, the existing stockpile of vaccines um, obsolete. Um, but there's also a big economic uh, cost as well to rich countries. So the International Chamber of Commerce estimated that rich countries, this is rich countries, not the global, not the global economy, but rich countries could be losing um, $9.6 trillion this year alone. And I, I have no idea how to compute that figure. <laughs> I just know it's bigger than billions, but, there's, but, tr but this is 9.6 trillion loss to, to the rich countries. And, that, and that's not, um, that, 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 and you can imagine that because of the way that the world is so globalized, because of you know, how supply chains work, because of how tour trade and tourism works and, and people traveling around the world, that um, actually insulating ourselves as, as a set of rich countries um, and not caring about the rest of the world is also um, economically short-sighted. Um, so, so how did we, so yes, yeah, so why did these uh, rich governments start to hoard middle of last year? And I think they started to hoard because they knew that the world would be facing a scarcity of doses. Um, and actually, when, you've, when, when, when human nature is faced with scarcity, often, unfortunately, uh, people react by hoarding. Um, we saw that certainly last year when um, the pandemic first hit and people started hoarding toilet rolls. Um, but, but in that hoarding experience, when I, I remember looking at it and thinking, actually, it's only those who've got the resources, the financial resources that can hoard, because if you're living on a, 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 a tight budget, a tight weekly budget, there's no way you can buy 10 weeks of toilet rolls with your one week of budget for that week. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of, so we see this, we've seen this hoarding issue kind of in a macro level at, at the global level where, where it's been the wealthiest countries who've had the resources and an ability to be able to, to, to hoard that have gone ahead and, and done that. And um, even while they were playing lip service um, in multilateral spaces like the UN um, and the World Health Organization and saying they care about equitable access so as they were doing these speeches and certainly Boris Johnson's done a few of these speeches on the side, they were taking all the, all the doses off the market in advance. Um, but I think the real question we need to ask, and this is what our campaign is doing, is asking why do we have a scarcity problem in the first place? Because I don't think this is about pitting off communities against each other. It's not about pitting off the, the person with underlying conditions in the UK with an elderly person in another country. Actually, we need to be asking why are we in this situation in the first place? Why aren't there enough doses for everyone? Um, and the reason why there aren't enough doses by everyone is because our pharmaceutical system, our global pharmaceutical system, is based on monopolies. So this means that when a uh, pharmaceutical company comes up with a vaccine or a treatment or a drug, it can patent it for 20 years. And during that 20 year period, no other company can make or sell that product. Um, so they essentially have a legal monopoly um, that is guaranteed for them in law. Um, and then the other, uh, the other aspect that supports that monopoly is they also have the technological know-how. So, um, even if you could find a company, even if you could find a way to break that monopoly, actually it's still difficult for a competitor to enter the market and make that same product because they don't have the know-how on how to make that particular vaccine. They don't know the vaccine recipe as it were. Um, so for example, with a, with, a, with a drug or you know, a tablet, for example, it's a chemical entity. So you could potentially, if you could get rid of the, um, the monopoly power, the, the, the patent barrier, you could potentially reverse engineer it and make it. And a lot of the generics that we've seen from India um, have, been on, on, have been made on that basis through reverse engineering. But because vaccines are biological materials, it's, it's much harder to make. And apparently the, the process is a much more complex process than just sort of churning out a batch of pills. Um, so because of that, it, um, it means that even if, like I said, they could break the patents, um, companies still don't have the know-how to be able to make that particular vaccine and so it relies on the pharmaceutical companies themselves being willing to share their know-how to share their vaccine recipe to share their blueprints to share their technological um, uh, knowledge around actual physical making of that vaccine so um, so to address this problem to address this scarcity problem we really need to address uh, monopolies um, and unfortunately, there, uh, the, the, a lot of the global schemes that have been set up in the past year, so for example, there was a, a global scheme called COVAX. It was um, set up to uh, bring together 
um, uh, to, 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 to purchase vaccines collectively. So countries would join COVAX and then the COVAX would purchase um, the vaccines and then distribute them equally to all the countries that were members. So on one hand, it, it sounds really fair, um, but the problem with COVAX is it doesn't deal with the problem of supply because um, that's what COVAX is facing right now. It's um, going to the marketplace and there's nothing to buy. Um, COVAX is also underfunded, so it's also struggling, it hasn't got enough money, so it's struggling with funding, but also it's going to the marketplace and there's nothing to buy because there's, the scheme doesn't tackle the underlying structural problem, which is the monopolies. So we've been calling for, uh, our campaign at Global Justice Now has been calling for two things that we think can help uh, um, transform this supply situation so that the world can produce enough supplies to meet global demand. And don't forget global demand is what we need this year, but potentially what we might need next year and the year after and the year after, because actually it looks like this coronavirus is here to stay. Um, I remember last year, we weren't sure whether it would just be a one-off thing and the virus would go away, but actually the scientists are saying this looks like it's becoming endemic. Um, so we do need to deal with supply. So the first thing we are calling for um, is actually a WHO mechanism. It's called the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool. Um, it was launched last May. And the idea behind this pool is that it would pull together um, all the health technologies that you need to tackle COVID-19. So it pulled together the uh, vaccines, the testing kits, the, the, the treatments, um, pull all together the knowledge behind them, data behind them, the technological know-how um, and the IP, the intellectual property rights behind them, pull them together in one place. And then the pool would then facilitate the licensing um, of that particular product to any manufacturer or any government who wants to make it. Um, so it's a, it's a really, uh, when we first heard about it, we thought, wow, this is a really amazing vision of how you could um, have a, such a scenario where you pull global, global commons together and share it out for the global good. And um, the only thing about the, C the only thing about CTAP, this, this mechanism, is that it has been set up by the WHO and the WHO can't really force or mandate any government or any company to do anything. It doesn't have that kind of power. It can only suggest and recommend. Um, and so even though it's been launched, actually no pharmaceutical company has joined it. Um, and in fact, uh, the, pharma, uh, the, the boss of Pfizer uh, dismissed it as nonsense. Um, and the, the head of the international pharma um, industry actually um, laughed at it and just thought that it was ridiculous. Um, and then country, there have been 40 countries that have joined it, but the UK and the US, um, and the, again, the, the same rich countries um, that have hoarded the vaccines, none of them have joined up to it. So it is struggling in terms of getting political, political buy-in. It's struggling in terms of getting buy-in from the industry, but we are still campaigning on it because we believe that um, we need to put pressure on governments and we need to put pressure on companies to do the right thing at this time. And then the second thing on the table at the moment um, being discussed in, um, internationally is a proposal that's been put on the table at the World Trade Organization. Um, and this proposal is to suspend the global rules on patents during this pandemic for any vaccine treatment or, or diagnostic or health technology that could help tackle COVID-19. So faced with this inequality of access, um, developing countries have come together to put this proposal down um, at the WTO. And the reason why it's at the, the World Trade Organization is because the rules around patents uh, um, are, have been written into a global trade agreement um, that belongs to the World Trade Organization. So, the, um, so this, this idea about suspending the patents would mean that you would break the monopolies, you would open up the rights to make the vaccines to any company, any manufacturer who wanted to make it. And we think that if this was coupled with the, the global pool idea, the CTAP, then this would also help with the technology transfer, the transferring of knowledge to um, other manufacturers. Um, so the, the, the proposal to suspend patents um, has been supported by um, 120 countries um, in the WTO. So the, the, the WTO has 164 members um, and 120 of them. So that's over two thirds of them are supporting this proposal. Um, but, it's, but the process has been blocked right now. Um, I'll give you 10 points to guess who it's been blocked by. <laughs> So um, it's been, yeah, so it's been blocked by um, the UK, the US, the EU, Switzerland, Canada, Australia, Japan, the very countries who have, uh, who are sitting on these massive stockpiles of vaccines for their own countries. Um, so they are blocking that, which is, uh, yeah, which is really, um, which is difficult because at the WTO, they agree things not by voting, but by consensus. 
so they need every country to agree um, if they were to take it to a vote tomorrow it would pass the, the, the proposal would pass but because they don't work on voting it's it, you have to convince every member to come on board um, uh, and so yes yeah, so we've been fighting for um, this uh, proposal as well again to put pressure on and uh, on on the governments that are opposing it and in particular being a UK-based organization we have um, you know it's our responsibility uh, to, to work with others in the UK to put pressure on our government um, to get our government to shift its position. Um, the proposal itself has had widespread support, not just from the two thirds of countries that are members of the World Trade Organization, but it was also supported by the Pope. Um, he actually, there was a meeting um, this earlier this week, and he, sorry, last week, and he actually gave a speech. He sent his representative to give a speech uh, from the Pope and to, to, to commend the, the proposal and to offer the proposal his complete backing and support. It's also supported by the W World Health Organization. They think that the patents should be suspended during this pandemic. Um, and it's also supported by UN agencies such as UN AIDS um, and, and 400 civil society groups around the world. Um, so there's a lot of pressure at the moment for this proposal, but uh, with the rich countries standing firm and not budging, um, we've got our fight cut out for us. But it's important that we keep fighting this because um, the rules that the, the, the rules around uh, patents uh, were actually written by the pharmaceutical industry themselves 25 years ago. Um, they lobbied hard. They wrote the rules for themselves for, to protect their interests, to create these really strong monopolies everywhere in the world that they went. Um, and um, so that's why this is a really key moment for the, this, this, this system hasn't been working for years. Um, people have been struggling to access medicines um, around the world uh, for the last two decades, whether it's HIV drugs, whether it's hepatitis C, whether it's cancer, whether it's cystic fibrosis. Um, there's been so many uh, struggles around access to medicines because of pharmaceutical monopolies. And I think that this current pandemic is only basically exposing that problem to the world. So, so prior to the pandemic, these, these struggles for medicines were largely confined to the groups it affected. So only if you were a breast cancer patient would you know of the struggle of accessing breast cancer drugs. Um, only if you were a hepatitis C patient would you know the struggle you've had to access hepatitis C drugs. Um, there was a moment about 25 years ago in the mid 1990s during the height of the HIV epidemic um, where suddenly the world woke up because the pharmaceutical companies were suing Nelson Mandela Mandela for trying to override patents to get access to HIV drugs in South Africa. And up to that point, the, the new treatments for HIV were really expensive and prohibitive for anyone in the global South. Um, so that Nelson Mandela proposed to override the patents and he was a face of a lawsuit by nine pharmaceutical companies. There was an absolute scandal at that um, situation. And I feel like we are heading towards that kind of situation with the vaccine situation. This, this seems no way acceptable that we can leave populations across the world without anything until 2023, 2024. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to finish up by, I just want to give this quote from uh, Archbishop Fabo Makobo of South Africa. He's the Archbishop of Cape Town and he wrote an article last week and I just thought this, 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 this thing that he wrote really struck me. Um, uh, yes, and, and really struck me really hard. And he said that, uh, and he was describing his experience of, experiences of growing up in apartheid South Africa. And he said, um, uh, I was at a personal level just denied access to go to white university because I was black and I needed ministerial approval to be in a white university. So these vaccines that are available in the global north reminds me that we are saying, just like in apartheid, hey, you guys are not human enough, wait a bit. Um, so yeah, I just felt like that for me is the nub of the issue here. So anyway, I just uh, leave that with you and um, I hope that's given you a good overview of um, what this issue is about, what our campaign is doing, um, and some of our ideas going forward. And if you have any kind of questions or ideas or uh, comments, anything, I'd be happy to take them. Heidi, thanks so much. And uh, what you said really uh, kind of brought to life what we've read, if you see what I mean.